Welcome everybody to Rebel Role Model. I'm your host, Nancy Koblenz. And today we are recording live in San Francisco. Um, today I have the founder of Female Founders Faster Forward. Welcome, June. Hi, Nancy. Thank you for having me. I am so excited because we're here in basically the epicenter of technology and entrepreneurs and venture capitalists and funding and all of that. So I'm very excited to get a female perspective on all that goes on around here. So um, let's start with what is Female Founders Faster Forward? Awesome. Since you introduced this, uh, the land that we're currently in, which is the land of, female, uh, of founders and uh, investments, particularly in Silicon Valley, um, my journey as an entrepreneur actually led me to found Female Founders Faster Forward. Okay. Um, two years ago, I started a big data analytics uh, software company. And after meeting several milestones of getting our first customer, we had six patents filed. We had the product ready. Wow. I started my journey as an entrepreneur seeking funding in Silicon Valley. Okay. And what I found out after meeting, reaching out to over 300 investors and 75 meetings, almost 80 meetings, that only 2% of female founders of 2% of startups with female founders get uh, get funded. So 98% that get funded are, are male? Are male. Okay. Or, um, and majority of those startups that are male founded are single male founders. So it's not a mixed team or it's not a group of uh, five different males. It majority of that is a single male founder. Interesting. So what happens to the... Um, the other female entrepreneurs? Unfortunately, and the research shows that 80% of women who, who actually start up their own uh, companies put 80% of their life savings into a startup like I did. I actually, wow. unfortunately for me, I invested almost a million dollars to achieve goodness. those milestones. Okay. And I and I knew that it was going to be a hurdle to, uh, to achieve um, um, uh, uh, funding because of being a female. I just didn't know it was unsurmountable. And so I put in that million dollars. I got the first customer. I had 10 customers in the pipeline waiting to do the proof of concept. Okay. I had the product ready at six patents. And I'm thinking, okay, I've, I've achieved uh, a lot and right. seeking funding should be an easier task. Right. Um, and unfortunately, it was closed doors, closed doors, closed doors. And after nine months of it, I started to look and really kind of look at the data. Okay. Who is actually getting funded? It, is it, uh, was it, it wasn't about my pitch. It wasn't about how I dressed. It wasn't how bad how I presented myself because that's kind of what I thought for the first nine months. Mm. And when I saw the data, that was really depressing. It was less about who June was as an entrepreneur. It was more about June, who June was, whether she was male or female. And wow. that was really depressing because there's nothing I could do about being a female. And only with only 2% of females getting funded, it was an unsurmountable task. So when you um, kind of found kind of the proof in the pudding with the data, um, was there a change in your strategy and tactics that you had to make for your company? There was. What I had to do was go from being self, um, instead of looking inwards as to what I was doing wrong, whether okay. I needed to change my pitch or I had to dress differently or I had to come across differently because when I was going into the meetings, I always heard uh, females need to be more assertive. Females need to do this and females need to do that. And unfortunately, I was actually applying that to myself. So oh, I wow. was taking that all inward and it was hard for me because I was constantly changing and having to say, okay, the next meeting I'm going to, I'm going to be more assertive. I'm going to be this, I'm going to be that. And I realized it wasn't about me. And it was when the data showed that it wasn't about me, I actually took that to Washington and oh. I went and met with the SBA. Okay. And unfortunately, the SBA um, is really focused on small business, but mm. small business on Main Street. Not I particularly got you. small business as in a startup in Silicon Valley or a startup in Boston or a startup in Dallas or a startup in New York. They were thinking small business, if June was opening a, a store on I see. Main Street, how can we fund June to get $50,000 or $75,000 so she has an upper leg to get into that business, right. but not particularly how can I fund June in a Series A of mm. $5 million or $6 million. They hadn't thought through that okay. because that's not their business model, and I kind of had to educate them that small business in the U.S. is very different. 
than it was 30 years ago. It is. Small business in the U.S. is about innovation. It is. How, is, how are startups being funded so they drive the innovation forward? And that's kind of, that's what changed my philosophy and changed my direction is how do you take it to the policymakers and say we have to do something different? So what type of technology were you into with that first company? So with the startup I founded, it was big data analytics. So okay. really kind of taking, it's all about the data. So how do you make data more accessible to the CEO and business leaders? Okay. And when I was talking to investors, the minute I said big data analytics, I lost them. Really? They expected me to come in with a fashion app or an oh. e-commerce <laughs> <laughs> clothing line yes. or a life, uh, a life magazine. Right. Uh, but they, but when I said big data analytics, and out of the 80 meetings that I had, only two of them asked me about the products. That's only crazy. Only two of them asked me about the patents. Oh my goodness. Only two of them asked me about the architecture of the product. And that's kind of what led me to believe it's less about me and, and, and more about what I don't represent, which is not being a, a male. Absolutely. So have you heard of the story? There were these two female um, techpreneurs that they had a, a male counterpart that was like this made up male persona that was able to get them in the door um, and able to get them into certain meetings just through emails as this guy. Yes, so I'll give you some examples. Out of the 80 that I met with, um, I had um, three or four of them tell me, as, as we're talking right now face-to-face uh, -face and um, um, just kind of uh, chatting, they actually suggested that my husband, who is uh, a, gra a computer science, has a computer science degree from Harvard, is a super coder, is what you would call a, call a 10Xer, they suggested that he take over the company no. and get funded because that's the only way oh I could get funded. Oh my God. And I'm like literally shocked right now. And that was my experience. I had people, uh, one of the investors forgot and left me in a, in a conference room and two hours later realized that he had forgotten me. Um, I had, I mean, literally, the minute when I said big data analytics, I lost them hmm. because they didn't expect a female. And uh, if you look at the market that I was in, the market space that I was in, it, it was, it's a $21 billion space. So right. there's a lot of uh, opportunity there for investors to invest in the space. And I was struggling to, to get five to $8 million in our, in our Series A. The, our closest competitor was closing the 11th round. What? 11th round and closed a total of $700 million. Oh single male founder. So for those that are listening that don't know what big data is, do you want to explain it sure. to them? So big data analytics, it's, it's basically uh, taking data, uh, applying some algorithms to it to see if that data gives you some insights. So the technology that I, I was bringing to the market for your audience is looking at, uh, let's just say you own a, uh, own a business and okay. you have 10 shops uh, across the United States. Now these 10 shops are operating individually in, the, in, in these different states and it's hard for you to understand based on how they're operating, how you could invest in another 10 states. That because, makes sense. Because you don't have the data. And what we were doing is gathering the data from these 10, uh, these 10 locations and feeding it up to you in a really compelling dashboard. So you, Nancy, as uh, in layman's tone, could look at the data and say, you know what? It looks like these three states are really driving the biggest um, growth. So we will reinvest in these states versus going into two other states that may or may not grow as fast as these three states are going. So that's the type of data we were serving up to business leaders if you were, if you were a business owner. Got it. And we weren't able to get funding. And like I said, even though we had our first customers, we had a healthy pipeline, we had six patents filed and a product that was ready to go into the market. So for having six patents, is that really unusually overachieving in a certain company that's a startup? So if you would look at, um, as, as I did coming into a market that's 21 billion, you go into a market thinking, okay, it's 21 billion, which means I've got about 100 competitors. Okay. So how do you go into a very busy market and still have something completely unique that the market is not addressing? Right. And when you take that kind of philosophy and that practical um, approach to it, you start building your product, your minimum viable product, based on your closest competitor. 
And so as you're building out your product, you're like, okay, I'm going to build my product that has this feature because the market doesn't have it and it's a needed feature. I'm going to build this feature because the competitor doesn't have it and it's a needed feature. So when you build a product like that, you end up with six patents because wow. you're building against your competition and you're building against what the market actually needs. And you're looking at the competition, you're like going, they don't have it, market needs it. Let's build to, for that. Wow, so that's, I mean, because um, interviewing so many different entrepreneurs and startups where they really start with some idea they have, some sort of passion that or skill they've honed, this is kind of reverse engineering it is. this product. It is. And that's amazing yes. how, so what you're saying is that in such a busy market as big data, you're able to see what the competitor is doing, but at the same time still be different enough and compete exactly. at the same level. At the same level. So there's room for both of you. Exactly. Wow. And, and we ended up, uh, the funny thing is, af after we built the product, you looked at our t top 10 competitors, and those competitors could have acquired us or even adopted our product, right. and we still wouldn't compete with them because we were so unique. Got that it. We, we came out with something that they didn't even have that, again, in a very busy market, that's very, very rare. So. Just a random question, is this kind of your approach, just kind of going through different stages of your life where you reverse engineer things? I do, and that's kind of why I started Female Founders Faster Forward. Right. I know it's a big thing to say, but we call ourselves F4. It is, I would say is that during my darkest hours when I knew that I was running out of runway, um, that million dollars was literally my 401k. My, I, was, I, I joke with my husband and say that's my alimony money. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and by the time I retire, I'll be kind of, pushing a shopping cart as mm. my uh, as my home but when you reach that runway you know that it's going to impact your kids education or your kids lifestyle and you say that's that's the end of it yeah and the hardest thing is to see that runway pass and then you have to stop operations you have to lay off people and the saddest thing is it's not because you didn't do something different or you addressed the market differently you didn't have a product that was viable it's because you didn't get funded Wow. And the hardest thing is not because you got f didn't get funded for something you didn't do, mm -hmm. it's because you didn't get funded for what you are not. Wow. And that was the hardest thing. And that was the darkest period in my time. Mm. It lasted about a few days. <laughs> and then I, I mentioned I was in Washington, D.C. with yes. the SBA. And I was looking through the slide set. And I used a tagline when I was showing what we had to do differently. And it, the tagline I, that I had was female founders faster forward. And it just dawned on me that if I was going to get anything out of my experience, that that's what I was going to go do. And it wasn't just about advocacy as to highlight, you know what, there's only 2% of women uh, getting funded. Let's kind of talk about it till, uh, uh, till we can't talk anymore. But how can we do something that's different? How can we build a product? Going back to my pragmatic, how do we build a product that would enable us to kind of change the dynamics? And so we're looking at building a startup investment tool okay. that would really take the bias and prejudice out of, uh, out of uh, investments. It would, take, uh, it would give everybody an even playing field. And it'll end up kind of helping female founders. Again, when, when there's so much rejection, where there's only 2% of women getting funded, women, as you can imagine, don't like rejection. Yeah. <laughs> so they kind of don't put them, their, their, uh, their selves forward in, right. that, in, that, in that place to get rejected. So with this tool, we hope more female founders come up, use the tool, and use that in the conversations with the investors to put them on point to say, my startup has achieved these milestones, kind of like as I mentioned earlier of, of, uh, of during our intro, is that we're building the tool similar to FICO, right? Okay. So how do you how do you have that same confidence as you would going into a bank and asking a, a, for a loan when you know you have a credit history of 600 or so? You have some confidence. You have some swagger. Right. And you know you could go into a bank and walk out with a loan. Mm -hmm. That's the same confidence and swagger I want to give to female founders when they use the tool in going into discussions with the VCs. So now this type of tool, I mean, it's revolutionizing this entire industry of investment completely. Um, I feel like as a startup or an entrepreneur here in San Francisco, there is only one way which is to get funding, right? You can't really, I mean, as you said, you were running out of the runway right, right, yourself yeah. and there's only so much you can put in personally. So what does it mean to really 
disrupt this whole funding process with female founders? I think you have to go into it knowing that it's going to be hard. Okay. Um, and you've got to have a tenacity that says, you know what, I'm not going to let people, particularly VCs, yeah. uh, put me down. Yeah. Uh, 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 and you go into the mo you go into it knowing that if you're going into uh, if you're going into startup uh, 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 or going to build a startup, understand the product you're going to build, understand who the customers you're going to go acquire, understand how you're going to go to market. Those are some of the key things you have to kind of work through. And when you do go. Go into uh, VC meetings with the confidence in I've got these milestones nailed and this is the funding I'm asking for. And leave it knowing that there's other, f other ways to get funded. And the other ways to get funded, it, it, I I'm seeing right now, is that they're more angel investors. Okay. They're more seed investors uh, rather than going into your institutionalized VC firms that have been on Sand Hill Road, if you know. Yes. Um, uh, for the last 30 years. Right. Seek other ways of funding and again, meet some of these key milestones before you go seek funding. Okay, so that, th that means there's, there needs to be a component of education. Yes. So what type of educational tools with this new FICO score that you guys are putting together are you presenting and providing to these female entrepreneurs? So one we're trying to say is that um, be confident. Okay. Get some swag, uh, get your swagger back. Yes. Um, uh, don't be afraid of that two percent of women only getting funded okay. because if we stay at home and if we stay in the shadows, we're not going to change that two percent. Right. So if you have a startup, if you want to get funded, be vocal. Okay. Be vocal in the VCs you're going to speak to. Be vocal in the rejection, because if you're not vocal, there's no, not, there's no change. So you've got to kind of be vocal on who you're meeting with, where the rejection is. And also, um, I would say is that one of the things that we're doing is really kind of highlighting how you could use the tool to drive more, uh, the adoption of the tool will drive more funding because again, it's all about the startup. Okay. It's all about the maturity of the startup. Okay. It's all about the milestones of the startup. It's less. It's going to be less about you being a female. It's going to be less about you, your color. It's going to be less about a lot of things other than the, the startup. The startup becomes the forefront of why you get invested. Everything else is secondary. Absolutely. So it really does even the playing field in that regard. Um, have you gotten pushback? Um, it. I haven't gotten pushback because I haven't taken it out to the VCs yet. Okay. Um, and the reason why I haven't taken it out to the VCs yet, I'll, I'll, uh, for example, I'll, I'll, I'll tell you why, is that when you're disrupting somebody, you don't go sell your product to That's true. the person you're disrupting. <laughs> That's true. Uh, but we, uh, to be, uh, to, on the other side, as I mentioned, we're building the tool, we've got over 750 startups in that baseline. Wow. 200 of them are VCs. The, again, these are not your typical Sand Hill right. institutionalized VCs, but these are still VCs investing a significant amount of money. Mm -hmm. And they've input their feedback into the tool. So from that perspective, we are, we're, we're kind of driving a, 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 an adoption at a rate that we didn't even expect. Wow. Um, it, the tool is is just for the founders, whether, again, whether you're male or female, hopefully you're female and we give you, and this gives you a better chance to yes. get funded. And if that results in 20% of female founders getting funded by 2020, that's the goal, then that's icing on the cake. But it creates wow. an even playing field yeah. and it takes away the prejudice and the bias because again, you shouldn't not be funded just because somebody doesn't like the color of your skin or doesn't like whether you're male or female. It should be about the startup. I absolutely believe that. So um, since we're based out of Dallas and Los Angeles, it's a little bit of a different entrepreneurial economy there. Um, I believe Dallas is the number one female entrepreneur economy right now. Um, so I'm in a different world out there. So here, it's like you're painting a totally different picture. Um, so with this tool that you're building, have you come across other female entrepreneurs that you've kind of partnered up with and kind of collaborated with and said, you know what, we can do this better together. Yes, so basically that's the intent. So tomorrow I'm going to be at an event called Fearless Female Founders. Wow. And introducing the tool there. So really kind of the focus for the next couple of months is how do you get female founders want to, uh, to uh, 
to adopt the tool mm -hmm. and then how can we kind of take the tool obviously it's in its uh, it's the first version of it but how do we work together to make it a much more tool for the for the years to come so yes absolutely it's working with other female founders other founders to make make this a much more robust tool going forward and are you doing that in conjunction with your startup I unfortunately, as I mentioned, I had to see uh, see um, uh, see the operations cl uh, shut down. So oh. I had to. So I've got six patterns on the shelf. I yeah. have a product on the shelf. Right. Um, and I hope that my story is the last. So I want to rewind a little bit because I can hear your accent. Are you originally from the States? Uh, no, actually, I was born in Calcutta, India. Wow. Uh, yeah. So um, did you go to college in India and then come to the States or did I, you? I did. I actually uh, was an early graduate. <laughs> okay. I graduated when I was 18 and a half, almost 19. And from college? From college. Not high school? Not from, co wow. yeah, from college. Wow. And uh, came here to the States, uh, being in tech, uh, literally grew up in tech. Okay. And so always been in, in Silicon Valley, Bay Area, uh, grew up in tech. And so um, coming out with uh, a startup company just seemed a natural fit for me. Coming out with a big data analytics solution just seemed the perfect uh, perfect fit for me. So everything kind of was the perfect fit going yeah. into this, except for coming out with not, uh, without uh, receiving the funding. Got it. So when you say that you kind of like grown up with the big data, because big data, I mean, it's kind of still a new thing and a newer industry, especially in technology. So were you really, how did you, like, how did you get into that then? So for me, it's always been about the data. Okay. Um, so even as a kid, um, so uh, one of the things um, I, I ta uh, one of my stories or back stories, as I mentioned, I'm from Calcutta. The, there's one famous alumni for the school that I went to. So I went to a boarding school run by um, Irish nuns. And Whoa. I spent um, all my, literally I was there from kindergarten to the 12th grade and then went to college. But Mother Teresa used to teach in my school. Wow. She was. And Mother Teresa used to come in with stories that for me that was, her stories became my data. Okay. And she traveled the world, as you could imagine. Yeah. So every month she used to come uh, to the boarding school and she used to tell us stories about her travel, um, stories about her meeting Princess Dio, stories about her meeting the Pope, stories about her meeting President Reagan and others. Mm -hmm. And those stories for me became data uh, that I kind of uh, retained okay. and information that I retained. And it gave me the sense that um, she was my data source. Uh, today, we are so kind of focused on social media and uh, everything is news and if you we're kind of consumed by 24-hour news. Uh, we got Mother Teresa coming in once a month. Wow. <laughs> Our news of the world was literally once a month. So she was my information, my data. That's amazing. And coming into the States, um, uh, and particularly being in business, when you see the lack of data uh, being uh, uh, um, in business, making in business decisions. So when, you, like the example I gave you early on, you can't grow your company if you don't have the right data. Okay. And I, uh, I saw the la when the lack of data costs people their jobs in most companies because people tend to get laid off because the business leaders are not making sound decisions because they don't have the right data. Okay. And l leveraging that knowledge is when I kind of decided to go into big data. Is how do you make data available to key decision makers? so they make informed decisions. So um, someone that's not necessarily into big data um, or in like large scale companies, can you explain to them that, um, that big data and translating that into just normal layman's terms is not something that you see on an everyday basis in all these companies? Like CEOs don't necessarily know how to read the big data even though most people would think, hey, you're a CEO, you should know how to read this. Exactly. So I'll give you some, I won't name the company I was in, but if, you, <laughs> if you're on LinkedIn, on social media, you'll probably do a research and see the companies I worked in before. But I was at a company that was $121 billion. Billion with a B. Billion dollars, <laughs> driving $121 billion. They had, they had a $6 billion big data uh, asset that I was managing as, as uh, the solution lead. Okay. The CEO and the chief financial officers used spreadsheets, 
to make informed decisions. So oh then, uh, during the time that I was there for four years, yeah. they had laid over, uh, laid off over 85,000 people. And the CFO and the CEO was using spreadsheets to make informed decisions. So the next question I would ask is, are these CEOs and COOs smart enough to even understand what is going on with the companies when it comes down to how you translate the big data, right? And then answers you have versus what they are informed of. In most cases, the CEOs want the data. Okay. But the, 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 uh, but don't have access to the data, even mm. though they're CEOs. Okay. Um, and that's one of the things that we address with the product is okay. understanding if a CEO, like the example I gave you, if you're making a, a decision based on if you're going to grow your three stores, it's how do you get that data that you need to make that decision? Right. It's about understanding uh, where that data is and serving it up to you as a business leader. And then you say, okay, you know what? Based on what I see, instead of opening these stores in three other states, I'm going to actually reinvest in three these three states because they're driving up a fast. The market is faster there. That makes sense. And it, the growth is faster. Right. That information, as easy as that is, is not really available for mm. the, these size companies, and it's mind-boggling. It, no, that's why I'm like trying to highlight this because most people would think, "Oh yeah, they totally have access." No. Uh, so Gosh. we actually did. Or uh, so I'll give you just another side story. Yeah. Um, I was meeting with an investor who mm -hmm. uh, who is on a platform that says she invests in in female founders. So I contacted her. She said she'll give us the meeting. I flew to Boston because she's based in Boston. Yeah. Um, I walk into the reception area, the, to the front desk, and they say, you know what, she's, she's, she's busy, but she, uh, somebody else will meet with you. Okay. Um, she sends in a junior associate oh. who has only been at the company for over the summer, so the course of the summer, so three months. And he wants me to prove my value proposition. So just the, the value proposition that I just talked about, just right. uh, um, giving you the example of you opening the stores, he wanted me to prove that value proposition before they would invest in me. Okay. So I'm walking out of the meeting thinking, how do you prove your value proposition? And I go, okay, I'll take that as a challenge. So I, uh, I literally overnight created a survey, reached out to 200 CEOs who yep. took that survey, and I went back to him and said, here's your proof. And he didn't even respond. Wow. Leave alone, he say, here's the, here's the investments you were seeking for. Great job on proving that I, something I didn't think you could prove. Right. Um, but that's kind of some of the experiences where you kind of, these startups, uh, these investors really don't look at the startups and really truly understand what the startup milestones are. Mm -hmm. It's really about whether or not they like you, they have relationships with you, and that's what gets funded. It's, it's not about the startups, unfortunately. Got it. So now with female founders, um, and you're really trying to disrupt this whole industry, um, does that also include getting meetings at certain VCs? Like, is there going to be a network of VCs that will say, yes, we'll always take a meeting with one of your certified uh, female founder members or something like that? Yes, the intent is to disrupt um the institutionalized uh, okay. VC. So these are the guys who've uh, who've uh, who've been there 30 years. Okay. These are the guys uh, that that have fundamentally driven the uh, uh, the bias and prejudice throughout the industry. Okay. So it's going to the smallest size VCs. It's going to the the micro VCs and the and the VCs who invest in seed stage or early stage startups. So those are the VCs that you want to go in because those are the VCs that are much more open to take meetings with the female founders um, and, and more open to ta uh, to look at new areas of how they could reduce risk. And, and if I go with saying, you know what, use this tool, and if anybody uses this tool, regardless of whether it's a female founder or a male founder, if they've used this tool, you know they've been assessed and it's a viable startup to invest in. Got it. Okay, so I want to talk a little bit about just our cultural understanding of female business owners and entrepreneurs and just female empowerment in general. I feel like with social media, it's kind of, it's kind of two pronged movement. One, it's been trivialized, but the other, it has strengthened our kind of uh, sisterhood, if you will. So from your perspective and focusing just on female entrepreneurs, um, how do you see kind of our air of 
feminism, if you will? Um, I think uh, if you, this whole past summer has, has kind of brought to light the, how women have been in the shadows. Yes. Whether it's a sec a sexual harassment in the workplace. We all know, I mean, both female and male knew that, that, that sexual harassment in the workplace was an issue. Mm -hmm. But unless, until we spoke out in numbers. Okay. The Me Too became a movement. Right. So, it, and uh, it wasn't just one woman speaking out. It wasn't a dozen. It was hundreds of women, thousands of women. And that led to millions of women saying Me Too. Yeah. And people started looking at it as it's a, it's a global issue. Right. It's not just Hollywood. It's not just uh, Silicon Valley. It's not just the VC community. It's all industries and global. And so that became a movement. Now, if you look at female founders, I think we are still in the shadows. Okay. Um, at 2% of investments going to female founders, we're in the shadows. Yeah. So I would say, and this is a, t uh, a tagline I use, is step in and step up. Okay. Be proud of who you are. And again, be, prou uh, be proud of the struggles y you're facing, but okay. be vocal about it. Because unless you're vocal like the Me Too um, uh, movement, it doesn't become a movement. It becomes just a couple of female founders or a couple of people just kind of uh, being advocates. But really, it isn't a movement until we collectively stand up and talk about it. Absolutely. So um, how are you trying to integrate more men supporters, right? Because I feel like that's kind of part of it is the, the, the support from the men to really propel this entire movement too. Because it's really just an inherent understanding that we legitimately are equal. Yes. So um, what do you think that Female Founders is doing to kind of spread that movement? So there are two types of men that I, I encounter. The first set of men will say, women need to. And they start off with, women need to be more aggressive. Women need to do this. Right. Women need to do that. And my thing to them is women don't need to be men to be treat, treated equal. Exactly. And those are the, those are the men that uh, once they kind of give me them, women need to, I kind of put them on the sideline because they're not advocates, because they sh inherently don't get it. Um, I've met uh, with, uh, with a lot of founders and a lot of investors over the course of these couple of months who get that that 2% is unacceptable. Yes. And those are, the, those, those are the founders and the investors that you want because they get it. They understand that 2% is unacceptable. But they also know that uh, by wanting it to be 20%, it's not going to happen something drastically has to change for it to happen. And that's why one is the female founders need to step out of the shadow, and obviously I need to deliver on the tools. So in, when you do that in parallel, then you could see that 20% becoming a reality. And Absolutely. so that's kind of what we're doing. We're doing, we're reaching out both the female founders and male founders. We're okay. reaching out to female investors and male investors, but you have to have the right attitude to be included because if you're still thinking that women need to be more like men to be treated equal. Unfortunately, I'm gonna put you back onto the sideline. Yes, 100% agree with that. So I wanna talk a little bit about um, advice for a female that might wanna start her own company. Um, I know you're very tech related, but do you have any examples um, of any female entrepreneurs within female founders that are non-tech related? I'm not so if uh, as tech uh, as technical I am I don't write code okay so um, so it's the um, it's having the tenacity to know that you don't have to write code to, to start up a, a, a startup okay um, understanding that if you have if you understand the market and you know that there's a need for the product you're envisioning, and you could get the development help. I mean, there's so many uh, um, developers that you could get today that you don't have to be a developer to actually bring a product to market. Okay. So don't let that stop you. Don't let you not being technical enough or you not being able to code scare you away. You have to have a sound idea. You have to have a market that you want to go after. Those okay. are your abilities, but don't let not being technical scare you because there's so many things that you could do to kind of ease that. So um, for your MVP, what do you suggest for proving that concept? Market. You have to have a, to a big total addressable market. Okay. You got to know who your customers are. Right. 
And you got to know that if, if the customer has the pain point and the customer is, is willing to look at and adopt your product. So you need to know market, you need to know customers, and you need to know how you're going to build a product to one, meet the customer's need, and to be, co be competitive in the market that you're going after. Those are your co fundamentals that at least I've used over the course, not just as an entrepreneur, but even in the tech world. Is Those are the three that actually are most important, is the market, customer, and, um, and the product. How do you go build that? So um, for receiving any funding, what, because I've heard now that um, VCs are becoming a little bit more strict in a sense of who they're giving money to with the proof of concept and showing that they have adopted customers and partners and that, um, you know, there's, there's money, there's acquisition actually happening. So um, from your perspective, even though the females are only 2% that are getting funding, what are those 2% females doing to get the money? So, the, uh, so unfortunately for me, the, uh, I wasn't part of the 2% because yeah. uh, it, those 2% were women who were getting funded were in e-commerce, okay. in fashion, okay. in fitness, Got in it. health. Okay. So markets that were, um, uh, that were considered women led or women only or, or what women do well. Okay. Um, and that in itself is, if you look closer into the data, uh, very few women in tech were getting funded. Hmm. But most women that were, were getting funded, for, for example, Reese Witherspoon got $10 million yeah. for starting up a website. Right. So she's she's counted in that two percent. Yeah. So th it's it's so you need so you need to uh, look a little bit further into the two percent. Got it. For women who are uh, are thinking about starting up, I I, I would say is again uh, there's a lot of seed funding and there's a lot of angel investors who are investing in what we I would call in a, the ideation phase. Okay. Meaning I have an idea. I know the market. Mm -hmm. I've got uh, customers that I know that will buy this when I develop the product. And you could still use the tool um, that we're, we're kind of building that kind of shows you you're in that stage. And that shouldn't stop you from getting funded just right. because you're, you only have an idea. Okay. It's just looking for the founder, for the investors that invest in the early stage startups in the ideation phase. And that's kind of where you look for uh, funding. Absolutely. So now with your network in female founders and you're having your event tomorrow, um, what's kind of the goal for tomorrow? Uh, the goal for tomorrow is to kind of just meet uh, female founders, get to hear their stories. Uh, um, they're they're going to be a few that, that were successful in achieving um, uh, VC funding. Okay. Uh, majority of them wouldn't have or still seeking funding. So just kind of understanding stories yeah. and being able to translate those stories into into broader um, a, a, into broader uh, messages so people like your audience and, and others will be able to hear again. Uh, step in, step up, be vocal. And that's kind of what the, uh, the, um, uh, the main goal for tomorrow is, is to get people to speak up. Okay, so what advice do you have for someone that's just graduating college, a female that might want to start her own tech startup? What advice do you have for her? Um, don't be scared of the journey ahead, okay. regardless of, uh, of where it leads you. And don't make the end of your journey uh, being, I got funded, because okay. that is just a start. Yeah. Um, and look for various ways of seeking funding before you're putting your life savings into it. Um, and um, I would say um, look at uh, angel investors, look at seed investors, look at the SBA if they have, uh, hopefully in the next year or two, they will think of uh, the SBA actually supporting startups, not just Main Street businesses. So look at your options before you put in your own money. And again, go back to the understand the market you're going to go into, understand the customers, and understand the product you're going to go build. Okay. And then build your network and your investors from that. Awesome. All right. Well, last question. Do you believe you're a rebel and or a role model and why? Bloody hell, I'm a rebel. <laughs> uh, I've been a rebel all my life. Uh, I think I've always been a fish out of water from even from a kid in boating school. Um, I, ne I, I don't believe that. Um, I, I, I believe you create your own destiny. Yeah. Um, and um, if there's if somebody is saying no to you, don't let that no define you. 
um, go figure out a way where that no becomes a yes on your terms. Yes. So the, hence the female founders faster forward. Am I disrupting the same environment that rejected me? Hell yes, because that's the only way I know I could do it. That's the o that's me. And so it's the same thing for your audiences. There's going to be a lot of no's, but don't let that define you. Mm -hmm. Go figure out to make that no a yes in your terms. Got it. Do you think you're a role model? Uh, I am to my daughter, and that's most important. So I have a 10-year-old oh. daughter who, um, who could define my, pr uh, my startup's value proposition better than I could. Wow. And she's 10 years old. Oh. Um, and I have a son, too. Wow. And I don't think that her world should be defined by her being a female and her brother being a male. Um, I never treat them differently. Um, um, the, they, it's their world, and her, um, her world is determined on what she, on what her efforts are, and the out, outcome is based on her efforts, and that's what I teach her. So, my, uh, so I'm a role model to my kids, uh, and um, and I, if I if I could be a role model to others just based on that philosophy, yeah, it's you do, you define your your uh, your destination, your efforts determine your outcome, and if there's any hurdles in between, like the like my journey through the VCs, mm -hmm. um, if you ta if you spoke to me today, I hope I haven't shown that they defined me, no, but they influenced my next journey, mm -hmm. and that's what it's all about. It's right. you're not only just on one path; you you have multiple paths during that journey, and it'll be it'll, it'll take turns, twist and turns, but at the end of the day, you control it and you own it. Absolutely. So do you want to share where we can find you, where Female Founders Faster Forward is? Absolutely. So social media, um, it's just uh, F4, capital dot org, June Manley on LinkedIn or uh, Twitter or Facebook. You could find me anywhere and um, I'm happy to be available. Thank you so much, June. I really appreciate this. Thanks, Nancy. Thanks for having me. Thanks All for right, listening. guys. Well, you heard it here. If you have any questions for June, any female entrepreneurs, or if you're thinking to start your own startup, please comment below. We'll make sure that she'll get all the questions. Um, and if you want to be a rebel role model, make sure to email us at rebel at rebelrolemodel.com. All right, guys. Enjoy your rest of your week.